So hi, everyone. Yeah, it works. Great. So um, you heard about this app that you'll have to rate things. I'd like you to test it. So take it out. Um, take the talk. And, and you know that it looks different on different phones. So just put the highest rating, see if it works. <laughs> ah, OK. OK, OK, you can wait for after. I, I'm going to talk about this subject that I've been kind of summarizing my approach to this field I've been really complaining about for a while. And, and for those of you who don't recognize uh, what I'm trying to do with this title, it really comes from my old experience playing this role. Well, no, not really. This is Peter Sellers in a 55-year-old movie. Uh, older than him. <laughs> yeah. uh, older than me, even. Um, I'm Gil Tene, I'm the CTO of Azul Systems, and, and one of the things a lot of people know from me for is, you know, I worked on garbage collection, work on garbage collection, I think I solved it. This is me working on the garbage collection problem. Um, this is 2004, so it's been a while. I've built a lot of things, I've played with a lot of things, but one of the things I've been going around and doing for several years in talks among other talks, is I go around and depress people. For some reason, people like it when I come and tell them bad news, I sound good doing it. And one of the areas where I depress people about is our understanding of response time and latency. And when I, I go and do a talk at a serious conference that likes words that match stuff exactly with no puns, this is a title. This is another title when people want to talk about microservices. But it gets more interesting when we talk about what it really is, how we're not doing it right. And the reality is there's a name for the theme that I've been using for several years, because when I talk to you, I often see your faces. And in this subject, there's usually this reaction that looks like this. This is the actual title for the subject that I often talk about. Now, we're going to do something different this time, because I'm going to I am going to, unfortunately, ruin some of your assumptions, but then we'll, we'll make you happy, hopefully, or at least accepting. Um, so with that, I need to give you a choice. So, you know, the, there's the door. You can take the blue pill, you can leave, and tomorrow you can keep believing whatever it is you want to believe. But, but you take the red pill, and we stay in Wonderland. And I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, um, all I'm offering is the truth. This is hopefully a good quote. Um, but really, this is a, a, a lot of times what I'll do is shatter basic beliefs about what we're looking at when we're looking at numbers. And we all like to look at pretty charts and numbers to see how our systems work. So, so let's start with a few simple examples. Here's a chart. Has anybody here looked at a chart like this about their system recently? Yeah, a few of you. This is taken from the web page of Grafana as one of the key examples of how the monitoring. This is usually a main thing in a chart in, in a in a dashboard. What we're looking at is a chart that shows the percentiles of response time on a cluster. The 95th percentiles, the 90th, 75, 50, etc. And what draws your eye in this chart? There's a, there's a spike in it, right? There's something going on, and maybe we want to investigate it. It's different than the rest, and, and maybe you should figure out what's going on there. And the reality is, I, I just wasted 10 seconds of your life, because there's nothing actual useful in this picture. It's just taking up space and room in your brain. This number is the 95th percentile. What's not on these charts? What's not here? the 5% things that are bad. They were thrown away before we showed the chart. And in reality, this is the kind of chart we show when we only want to show good things, when we want to censor the truth, when we want to pull the wool on your eyes, when we want to go to our boss and say, hey, um, I want my bonus, even though reality says you shouldn't get it. right? And it's a chart that's very useful to achieve this purpose. If you're doing it to yourself, just, just think about that. Now, 
I, I've done this exact chart in a few talks, and people come up to me and contribute material. This is from somebody in a previous talk. They said, you know, I went and asked our guys, what does it look like for us? And they gave me this chart with the median and the 95th percentile, and et cetera. So I asked for more data. And they said, yeah, we have more data. Here's the 99th percentile on that chart. So if you're wondering if there are bad things hiding above that 95th, yeah, they're by definition, they're there. And they're by definition worse than everything you're seeing. And they could be pretty big. Another interesting thing is we look at these charts and they have numbers. The average is 53 something. That's two orders of magnitude below what 1% of your people are experiencing. But that's the number you'll probably catch your eye. So I, I like to rant about this, and, and I have a format in which I rant about it. I'll tweet. Um, latency tip of the day, I'll tweet something like this. Averages are completely meaningless ways of uh, talking about responsiveness. And then after I tweet, I'll blog post and rant about my own tweet. Um, I haven't done some of these in a while, but there's a few of them there. Um, this, is, this chart is from one of those. This is chart is a treasure trove of really cool bad things all in one picture. Let's look at another simple example. Um, so we have these pictures, but if I talk to somebody on the phone and I say, well, well, how is that doing? What is it behaving like? It's hard to say on the phone, well, it looks like this. So we want numbers, we want summaries, and here are numbers. This is a charting uh, part of a, of a monitoring system, and, and for any line, we can get numbers. That number is the average of that line. But what does it mean to average the 95th percentile? I mean, mathematically, what does it mean? And, and it's, it's just nonsense. It has no relationship to 95th percentiles or averages or anything else. It's a mathematical formula, but let's, let's go through a simple exercise. Suppose I look at another percentile, the 100th percentile, the maximum, and I have this series of numbers that I carefully picked. And I want to talk on the phone about the series of numbers because it's long, so I'll average it. The average, worst case, is 42. I picked the numbers to get that number. What does it mean to say the average of the maximum is 42? It's utter nonsense. The 42, I mean, the average is clearly 601. And if you look carefully, there's not a single number in the series anywhere near 42. But it's a summary. This is just as much nonsense for any percentile as it is for the maximum. And, and the simple tip for you guys, again, that number on all your screens, it doesn't mean anything. You just can't do that math. It doesn't work. When you talk about percentiles. Now, we often will kind of try and excuse this and say, OK, we understand. It's not exact. It's about. But hey, I'm covering most of the range, 99%. Hey, not too bad. So, it, so is this an indicator of what's going on in your world? So imagine that you have a web browser and a customer or a service, and, and you, you, you click on one button and one link. And the question is simple. What are the chances that I'm going to experience worse than the, worse than the 99 percentile of one of those services that's under the hood, like a search engine node or some cache or database or CDN or a microservice of some sort? Right, Because that's what we're measuring in all these monitoring systems. What are the chances that I will experience worse than that number? Here's some simple samples from websites that I collected. I went to my browser, pointed at the website, said, you know, how long does it take? How many operations? This is how many individual requests were sent. And if we imagine in a utopian world that all of them went out in the same time, didn't have to get one before you send the other one, here's the math and chances of experiencing the worst than the 99 percentile on any one of those web pages. It's pretty high. In fact, it's more than half for any one of those pages except for the very clean Google search page that has very little on it. And since more than half of clicks are going to see worse than this number, you should keep that in mind when you look at the number. That, that number is not a rarity. It doesn't cover the vast majority. In fact, it covers very little. If we try and model an actual session, 
let's say we have a very short session, five different link clicks, and each one of them is as clean as the Google search page, no, no junk on it. And the question we want to ask is, how many of the people that interact with this, how many sessions will see something worse than the 95th percentile? The actual math comes out to this. 99.997% of sessions will see something worse than what you're looking at. Why are you looking at it? Is it just to keep yourself happy? To not really know what's behind the curtain? If we look at something a lot more aggressive, like the three nines, and ask the question of how many will see at least one response that's worse, it's 18%. This is better in the sense that at least 80-some percent are seeing less than this, but 18% will be worse than this. No business can survive that. So if you want to keep this as a short thing, that median, that average, those common case things you're looking at, that's the number everything is worse than. And that's not a, uh, that's not a euphemism. Okay, so that's just the math. But all that just assumed that all those numbers I looked at actually mean anything to begin with, that we measured something that is those percentiles. And here's where there's an accidental conspiracy that's going on. I found it a few years ago, and I named it. I call it the coordinate emission problem. And have you noticed how I spell percentiles? Anybody notice that? I've carefully spent, spelled them as percent lies everything so far. This is why there are lies. So coordinate emission has many, many forms. One common example is when we monitor stuff, we measure how long things took. We take time before, we take time after, we compare them, that's how long it took, and then we put it in buckets and report them and do percentiles on them. Unfortunately, this is susceptible to a couple of key problems. And the simple way to show you how bad it can get is to run a hypothetical. Imagine that I took a perfect system, could do you know, a lot of things, and we just measure it with 100 wicks a second. Every one of them is perfect, exactly one millisecond. But then I go and I stall the system. I hit Control-Z on the keyboard, some pause happens, whatever it is. And, and the simple question to ask is, how would you want this system to describe to you if you're looking at one of those monitoring pages? So let's try and do simple modeling. Um, on the left, we have an average of, you know, one millisecond, obviously, right? On the right, we have an average of 50 seconds. Anywhere between 100 and zero will be there. The overall average is going to be 25 seconds. There are no tricks here, by the way. And if you want to look at percentiles, these are the percentiles. They're common sense percentiles. The median is really good, then it gets worse, and it gets terrible at close to 100%. That's what's really happening here. What will our monitoring systems t tell us about this? What will a load balancer tell us, or, or a load generator tell us about this? Well, if we actually measured the way we measure everything, we'll, we'll get a whole bunch of results here. That's nice. Then we'll get one big, big result here. It's also nice. And then we'll put them in a bucket, and we'll figure out that the average of that is about 10 milliseconds. Not quite the 25 seconds that we know at all. But this will also tell us that the 99.99th percentile of that system is near perfect. Yeah, go to production. Everybody's happy. Don't worry about it. Nothing bad's going on here. And what's really happening is if we had measured the right way, if we had the data, if we had a way to measure what's going on during stalls, which we don't in, a, in an actual production system, we would have had all these results. Coordinate emission simply erases the bad stuff. It leaves one in there for you to think that maybe it measures something. And it's more than that. Um, if you try to improve a system, you will often make it look worse. So suppose I took the system and instead of stalling for 100 seconds, I made it much better. It didn't go quite as fast, but it answered every question in five milliseconds. If I ran the math, I'd find out that it got you know, much worse than before. I probably need to throw that change away and go back to the much better system that was stalling for the whole time. Anyway, this is a mess. You can probably see why. And, and, and in reality, you get these kind of separations, orders of magnitude of separations in what's being reported compared to reality. And that's unfortunate. Um, and, and a way to think of it and, and kind of 
normal world times is when we measure things like response times and service times, you know, service time is how long it takes me to make something to serve, but response time is how, much, how long the client sees me take something to prepare for them. Um, the coordinate emission problem basically makes things you think are response times and monitoring and modeling actually just measure the little service time component. Now, the way the real world reacts to that often looks like this. This is the virtual real world on Twitter. You know, people actually noticing the difference once it's pointed out. And, and this is really where I got the red pill, blue pill idea for this talk because you know, Twitter told me there's a red and a blue reality to this. Great. Okay, so hopefully I, I, I caused a little bit of depression and you guys understand that percentiles are completely meaningless on your screens and the chances of a number from a system showing up on your screen in a chart and actually being right is so low because there's so many ways for it to go wrong in the middle that the actual reaction tends to be like this, like Matthias seemed to be feeling before the talk. Um, and, and it is a little bit like this, or a way to say it is, how does the world even work? Like, if we know it's so wrong, how does it even work? So, the good news is, there's a rainbow at the end of the tunnel. Um, I, I've been talking about the subject for years. I've, I've shown people how to fix their measurements, improve their stuff, model things better. But I've fundamentally given up on fixing those numbers on your screens. They're not going to get fixed. At most, you can ignore them. How do things even work? And if you think about it, the reality is people have to run real systems. And if we focus on the monitoring part of the systems that we do, somehow what we do works. And clearly, it doesn't work because the math is right. What makes it work? Well. My opinion is the world is full of superstitious things that we do that have no effect on reality, but happen to happen right along things that really do. You know, thousands of years ago, if you got hurt, you went to a witch doctor and, and they did a dance and, 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 and rubbed something on your forehead and gave you a potion and sent some smoke around and asked people to sacrifice some goats. And one of those things probably helped. The other ones had nothing to do with what happened, and, and nobody knew which one, right? It doesn't matter. You kind of know it's a better, you have a better chances of healing if you go to one of those. And, and you know, we had that in Europe with bloodletting for, for hundreds of years. That's going to help you, right? Um, we still have superstitions about black cats and what happens when you knock on wood. They don't affect anything real, but they make us feel good. So you can keep looking at the percentiles if you make it feel good. But there are things you do that actually make it work. Those things to do have to do with the fact that we cannot afford, we cannot avoid monitoring and watching actual failures. We are looking at whether things work or not, regardless of how we do the math. And, and the reality is between good and complete failure, we have gradations. There's, it works, but not quite as happy as we'd like to, or, you know, there's the, it's, it's, it's uh, much worse than it should be. This thing stopped working. Um, so we have this, oh, things are a little angry here, effect too. Um, when, we, when we look at this, the actual thing to focus on is the miserable stuff, the things that are bad, the things like any of these that can go wrong and you inherently, regardless of what you did with how good is it, you measure how many bad things happen. You can't avoid it. If you don't, the phone will ring or you'll get fired. So inherently, we always measure the timeouts, the retries, the failures, the whatever it is we're able to measure that is bad. And, and we can't avoid it. Surviving businesses don't avoid it. They would have died otherwise. And we do that in addition to all the other stuff. So. If we looked at this stuff and, and, and tried to measure failures against percentiles, you realize that it's absolute nonsense to say, is my 50th percentile a timeout? If, is my 99th percentile a timeout? Even if you knew the answer, what do you care? What about the 99.1% or the 88.9%? .9%? The reality is what you measure um, 
and, and ask is not what is my percentile in terms of failure, but what, how many things failed or what percent of things failed. Failure happens at 99.35% rather than the 99 percentile is this and the 99.9 percentile is this. If we count things, and monitoring systems are really good at counting things, really good at displaying them, there's no bad math to be done there, you can actually average that just fine, then we will get, well, nice pictures that look like this. We can watch for failure, we can monitor it, we can see that as the load grows, the failure rates start mounting and the success rates drop. This is a, an actual production chart looking at the top 2%, from 98% to 100% of success. And success is starting to go bad when load goes up. Now, in the world we live in, there's more than one thing to watch, right? You probably have a bunch of systems interconnected, services, microservices, etc. Here's an example of what it grows to when you succeed. This, by the way, is Amazon 10 years ago. 10 years ago, okay? It's much, much worse now. Um, so when you look at a microservice, remember what you're looking at, right? When you're watching this one thing, remember what it is. It's a piece in a big system. And that piece has a big effect. And if we want to measure the misery of that one piece, that's good and that's fine, but you want to remember that it has a global effect, so you want to measure the misery or happiness of everything. This is where be much bigger summary things and charts look up, but the thing to pop up is, is it happy or miserable? Not what some specific imaginary percentile you're never going to measure right anyway is. So the takeaway for you guys is if you want to focus your work, if you want to focus your understanding, focus what you try to improve or what you watch for a problem, focus on misery. Don't worry. You know, just focus on the misery. Things will be okay. And if we wanted to, one last latency tip of the day, think about it this way. Don't aim to make a percentile good or acceptable. Instead, aim for an acceptable percent of misery. And that's my talk. <laughs>